Good morning and welcome. Welcome into this house. Welcome into the presence of God. Lord, we thank you and we praise you that your presence is here and that you are always with us. And Lord, as we continue this time of worship, Lord, I pray that your spirit rests on each and every one here. And those of those of our church family that are not with us today, Lord, I pray you go to them too and rest your presence on them with strength, with gentleness, with tenderness, and with a real sense of who you are and who we are in you. Lord, we just sung the reckless love that you've lavished on us, Lord, and, and we can't thank you enough. can't thank you enough. Welcome, everybody. The passage that comes to mind, I've been spending time in the book of John, in the, the uh, chapters 14 through 17, where Jesus talks to his disciples on the night of the Last Supper, and it's one of the longest passages, it's in red print, if you do the red print Bible, it's, you know, it's a solid red print for three chapters. And somewhere in the middle of chapter 15, he says, Jesus says this, I have loved you, even as the Father has loved me, remain in Simple words, simple words, great depth. Doesn't it feel good to declare that? I am a child of God. Yes, I am. Oh, we thank you. We praise you for that abundant and endless and bottomless grace that you offer to us and that it holds us. Help us to know that safety in you, being held, that your grace is sufficient for everything. Lord, we praise you from the bottom of our hearts, we praise you. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Please have a seat. We're going to continue our worship now. Thank you for tithes, tithes and offerings. Okay. Let's give thanks to God. Father in heaven, we say thank you for this moment in time where your grace does hold us. In perfect harmony and balance, we thank you, Father, for all that you have given. And as we give back through tithes and offerings, Lord, we just know that you'll continue to sustain us, empower us with all that we need for what is ahead. I thank you for those who are serving us. And again, Lord, I just thank you for little Susie for the joy that she brings into my soul, for the joy that she brings into many other people. I want to pray, Father, today that your joy will be her strength. Father, I thank you for Dave and his just honest desire just to be in your presence. And Dave, I see you like a guy that has uh, that number one ticket for the event of worship, where you just hunger and desire to be in those places with God's presence and just the Lord's favour is all over you. Andrew, again, you are a man of integrity and strength. And today I just pray that the Father's uh, voice will be heard and seen through all the things that you do. And for you, Naomi, may you continue to be just such a, a prophet of the God Most High, hearing his voice, knowing his voice, and speaking his voice. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to church. Hello. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> it's good to have enthusiasm in church, right? So welcome to church. Hey. We nearly got there. Welcome to church. Hey! Now we've got it. A few things coming on up. Uh, we have uh, our lunch downstairs today, Cafe Church, and we have two really wonderful uh, people speaking into us. One is Pip up the back there. Um, what does your name mean about horses or something? Lover of horses. Lover of horses, a name that Trish would love to have. The lover of horses. And we have Pete. He is the one that Christ is building his church upon, and he's sharing with us at the cafe church table as well. So come on downstairs after the service. If you haven't brought anything, don't worry. I'm sure that we will spread it and move it and so that everyone can eat. Uh, but it's going to be a great time. So as we finish this morning, we're just going to move on downstairs and have dinner, have lunch. Um, each week we're highlighting one area of our church that we'd love to get some more people involved in and this week is the camera. Right there with, with Naomi, she is on that thing every single week and she would like to have a break every now and then. 
And uh, so it doesn't take a whole bunch of expertise, but it just takes some time just to sit with Naomi and go, what do I need to do to get this thing done? You don't have to edit the video. You don't have to publish it on YouTube. That's all that Naomi is doing. But she would love to have some people in the church that are happy to do exactly what she is doing right now. Amen. Smiling. <laughs> she has a brilliant smile, does she not, Victor? Yeah, she does. <laughs> help you if you said no, right? <laughs> There's such joy over Naomi's life, and she's such a, a such a friend of many. Uh, next Sunday, so next weekend, there's a few of us that will be missing from church, uh, taking away a prophetic mentoring retreat. And so I'm taking away at this stage 52 people uh, down to Atunga, and some of you guys are coming with us. Now, don't think that nobody's going to be here because there will still be plenty of people here, and my dad is coming to preach. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> And I'm sure he'll appreciate some enthusiasm next week. So come on to church. Uh, my father will be here preaching and there will be still full worship team and we'll have a, a great time here at church. But while we're gone, I might ask you to pray for us as we're away and listening for the voice of God and just spending time in his presence and with his people. Uh, we're going away on Friday evening all the way through to Sunday lunch and it's just going to be an excellent week of, weekend away and I just really appreciate you guys praying for us. Coming up, we have Honours about to speak to us. You are? No? I've got it here highlighted. It says Honour to speak. Honour's going to come up and share a word with us in a sec. She's got about 30 seconds to think of a word to come and share with the church. In the meantime, we have the World Day of Prayer coming up Friday the 1st of March. This is something that we do every year and we combine with the, the other two local churches in the Catholic Church and also St David's, the Uniting Church down the road. It's an ecumenical service that will be held this year over at St Joan of Arc. It's 10.30 at morning for morning tea and then 11 o'clock service. That's Friday the 1st of March. Uh, please see Mila. She is up the back. There she is. Um, and uh, if you'd like to get involved with that. And so with that, what that means is you'll be doing like a, a liturgical reading inside of the service. It's all there, and it's just it's an awesome time of all the churches gathering together. So, Honor, come on down. Alrighty, so I had to say a quick prayer. Anyway... <laughs> So the word I got was deliverance, um, and normally when you talk about deliverance, it's more what you're delivering from, but I got what we're being delivered into, and so I got that as a church and as people on our own walks, we're being delivered into the presence of God, and just we're about to have a deeper and more intimate understanding of that. Thank you. Pretty simple, right? Deliverance, who's up for some of that this morning? To be delivered into a more intimate place with Jesus. I think that should be the desire and the passion of our heart for every single day of our lives. Amen. That it's not just an event that we come to or a service that we attend where it's like a, a, this is the open door to the kingdom. It's one of them. But there are many. There'll be one when you sit down for lunch with us downstairs, there'll be an open door to the person beside you, the person across from you, an invitation to hear their story or to hear their conversation, an invitation to love. Every single invitation to love is an opportunity for your world to get a little bit bigger. Every single one. Every single moment of your life is a moment that the Father inhabits and the Father is speaking in and through. I feel like at times that I, like I'm nearly 50, but it's just this concept that I'm just now learning and discovering more of the richness of his voice and how available that is, and how present that is, and how real that is. In every moment of every day. Last night, a few of us were at the Spirit and Grace worship night over at Grace Point Church. And again, it's these moments in time where all people gather, when we ran it kind of like an extra service on a, on a Saturday night, where we just allow the Spirit of God to do what only the Spirit could do. To listen for what people like Honor was just sharing like there, which is people speaking out time and time again. 
watching people just stopping to pray for each other, watching people just stop to hug and to love and to laugh with each other. There's something about that from my point of view last night where we're watching the kingdom grow. This morning is another one of those opportunities. I want to read to you some verses from Genesis. Two weeks ago, I spoke to you a message of Joseph, and it's like Joseph part one. This is Joseph part two. There's certain key figures in the Bible that really uh, speak a whole lot into my, my own life, and, and Joseph is definitely one of those. And Joseph occupies a bunch of chapters in the book of Genesis. I'm going to be reading to you from Joseph, from Genesis chapter 45. And, and just so if you don't know the story or if you're just catching up with what the story of Joseph is all about, uh, Joseph was loved by his father very, very much. Uh, in fact, the Bible says that Joseph was the favoured one, the golden child. He was the one that the father loved the most. Not the best parenting technique in the world, but it was what he went with. To be the most favoured and the loved child in the family meant the other bunch of brothers weren't too pleased about his place of privilege. And so at one point he was loved by his father so entirely but hated by his brothers equally as much. To the point that at one point they had this brilliant idea of selling Joseph into slavery. That would get rid of the problem. It got rid of one problem for them but it added another problem to them. Because once they held a secret they had to hold the secret. And keep the secret. And with that secret came guilt and shame. And so for many, many years they held this, this guilt and shame. Yep, they hadn't seen Joseph anymore. But they gained something they did not expect. Joseph's story goes he was sold into slavery, but then he was bought by a, a, um, a man in Egypt by the name of Potiphar. And as Joseph served in that home, the Bible said he gained favour in that home and the Lord was with him. That was that phrase we used two weeks ago, the Lord is with him. It's the same phrase that you can speak over yourself today because it's true. The Lord is with you. We look back at Joseph and see how unique he was that the Lord was with him. But through Christ now and through Christ crucified and resurrected, the Lord is with us. Every single one of us. It's like we are Joseph. That the Lord is with us. There's things happening in around us right now and people can say the Lord is with us. How do they know that? The world knows that we are his disciples by the love that we have for each other. And it's just such a brilliant concept of the kingdom of God that when people see love, they actually see God. And they can see that the Lord is with us. So in Joseph's time to Potiphar, the Lord is with him. And Potiphar saw it and he understood it and he got it. And here is a guy who didn't worship God, but he saw God in a man. And through that, he followed this slave by the name of Joseph. And before you know it, his whole house is flourishing. And once again, Joseph's life takes a turn for the better. And there it is, and he's flourishing in the household of Potiphar. But inside of that space, Potiphar's wife decides that she would like to sleep with Joseph. And she goes after Joseph. And when Joseph rejects her, she goes to Potiphar and says, This man tried to rape me. And all of a sudden, Joseph's life again takes a turn and he finds himself in Egyptian jail. And it's inside of that space where the, the warden or the jailer says, The Lord is with you. It doesn't matter where Joseph goes, the Lord is with him. It doesn't matter the situation, the circumstance, the Lord is with him. It's the same with you today. I can only imagine what Joseph was feeling because at times I'm sure he would be saying, Lord, where are you? If you've just been accused of a crime you did not commit and thrown into a, uh, an Egyptian jail of over 3,000 years ago, it would be an easy place for you to go to in your mind to say, where have you gone? But there's these people who are saying, the Lord is with you. Could the Lord have changed that in a moment? He could have. 
But it seems as though he was in, in slavery for uh, quite some time. It seems as though he was in jail for quite some time. And, and what Joseph kept doing while he was there was allowing the Lord to be with him and to work through him. And so I wonder whether even in the situation that you find yourself in today, if you're finding circumstances that are beyond your control, that you could actually rest in the moment that the Lord is with you and that while he has you in this place where everything seems to be out of control, there are things that he is going to put in your life to speak into, to change the lives of the people that are around you. This is why Joseph's life speaks so much to me. So Joseph's in jail and he interprets a couple of dreams for a couple of other prisoners and, and one goes fantastically well for one and he gets released and the other one comes true too and he actually gets executed. Uh, that would be a very difficult dream to interpret or get to pass on. But then finally Pharaoh hears that there's a guy in his jail that actually interprets dreams and, and sure enough Joseph is, uh, Pharaoh is having all these dreams. And Joseph is called forward once again. Here's another thing about Joseph's life. It did not matter if he was talking to prisoners or Pharaoh. The Lord was with him. The same Lord that spoke to prisoners is the same Lord that spoke to Pharaoh. He didn't withhold his words. He didn't think the person opposite him wasn't worthy of the words. He just allowed himself to be that person who gave the words. And there is Pharaoh and he says, I've had a dream and nobody can interpret it. Nobody can understand it. I wonder, Joseph, if you, could, if you could help me with it. Anyway, let me just push this into a, just a few moments. He interprets the dreams, the dreams come true. And all of a sudden, Joseph finds himself second in charge of all of Egypt. His life has had an amazing change. Put it in context, though, he still has no idea where his dad is, doesn't know if he's alive. Doesn't know what's happened to his brothers. Has no idea about his family. But he has this place of authority inside of Egypt. And while he is there, an encounter with his brothers is about to happen. So the Egypt goes into famine. And the famine hits so hard that it spreads to the neighbouring uh, places of Canaan where Jacob and, his, and Joseph's brothers are. And Jacob sends the brothers to Joseph. The first time Joseph sees them, they don't recognise Joseph. They can't believe, they wouldn't be able to believe he's alive anyway. And, and Joseph kind of plays a trick on him. And you can understand what Joseph is thinking. If anyone has ever betrayed you in life, the last thing you actually want to do is have a relationship with them, right? You want to keep yourself safe. You want to know that they're not going to hurt you anymore. You want to know what their intention is. You want to know all of that. So there's a gap between them and they don't recognize who Joseph is. And so Joseph is playing with them. And he sends them home to go get the youngest brother, Benjamin. And when Benjamin comes back, this is kind of where we pick up our story this morning. Because when Benjamin comes back and Joseph sees Benjamin and Joseph sees his brothers, all of a sudden God's voice of restoration starts speaking stronger than the voice of vengeance that's speaking inside of Joseph. And when God's voice of restoration starts speaking, it's a voice that we need to start listening to. When God's voice of restoration wants to be greater than the betrayal that is around you, then there is a greater healing that is ahead of you. Do you agree with that? And I wonder whether we could actually put some of this into practice for our own lives and our own selves because there'll be times right now when I say this kind of stuff, it provokes things in your minds to say, there's no way in the world I could say that to that person. There's no way in the world that I want to see them again. There's no way in the world. And God's like, that's, that's, that's kind of the point. It's His will. He wants to do it. He wants to heal. He wants to restore this is Genesis 45. Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room and he said to his attendants, Out, all of you. So he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. Then he broke down and wept and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians could hear him. And word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. He says, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realise that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. Don't be upset 
don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to, to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five years more and there'll be neither, pl neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master over all the land. So come down and meet him. Can you see the shift in Joseph's world and Joseph's life? All of a sudden, the events of these last bunch of years have started to make sense to him. When he was in jail, they probably didn't make sense at all. When he was sold into slavery, it probably didn't make sense at all. But now, all of a sudden, when he's standing in front of his brothers and he can see the salvation and deliverance of his family, all of a sudden he gets it. God has been moving him and placing him into such a place as this for such a time as now. And while he is in that place, place he opens his heart he moves into a place where he draws his brothers back again even when they don't know what's about to happen the guy that's in front of them is the one who can take their lives the one who is in front of them like he would be entirely within his rights to say i'm going to bring justice now to this moment but what did he do he opened his heart and he wept and he wept he wept so loudly that people outside the room could hear. When was the last time you wept that loudly? When was the last time your heart broke? If you can remember the last time that your heart broke, you'll know exactly what Joseph is feeling right now. Because as Joseph is seeing it with his own eyes, his heart is breaking for what is occurring in front of him. And he's doing everything that the Father now has shown him. He's drawing his brothers back now into relationship with him. Even when they didn't deserve it. Even when they didn't think it was possible. He opened a road that brought healing. Is that not what Jesus is doing for us? This morning I got down to the church, it was quite, quite early, the sun was just coming up and I was standing in my office and uh, in the morning there's a beautiful breeze that comes in through my window and I opened the window and I just stood there with the breeze blowing on me and as I do when listening to the voice of God, I said, Father, can you just speak a word for me for this day? And as I felt the, the wind on my face, I could hear the world starting to awake. And I heard the phrase in my mind, the world is awakening now. When I heard that initially, I thought, yep, there's traffic and there's cars, there's people. But it was the phrase again, no, the world is awakening now. I thought about uh, last year when Trish and I and a few of us went down to awakening in Melbourne. And a nation was called to be awakened. There have been over the last few years songs that we've been using with this phrase of awakening in it. And all of these verses and words started flowing back into my head of things now becoming alive and being awakened and being delivered into. All of these words are now starting to be real. And so when you hear that phrase, and like if you go on the internet and follow any prophet you like, they'll say something like that. And it's such a big phrase, you just go, okay. I don't know what I'm actually going to do with that, but that's okay. But I stood there at that window with the breeze on me and going, what does it mean for the world to awaken? The verse that came into my spirit is the verse that you guys have heard me use a lot lately. Love others as I have loved you. When you love somebody, something awakens. Think about it. When you love somebody, a safe place is given, something grows, something awakens. The world, will, the world will know that we are his disciples by the love that we share with each other, the love that we awaken each other with. And I know that I'm speaking into a, a small community of people in the inner west of Sydney, but could it be that today's message is being picked up by many churches all over the world? That the Father just didn't say it to my spirit, but he said it to many people's spirit. The world 
is awakening. 3,000 years ago, when Joseph stood in front of his brothers, something awoken in that moment that would never, ever be forgotten. A love was awoken, and Joseph there realised that God was in full control of everything that was happening around him. All of the disappointment, all of the frustration, all of the wonder, all of the anxiety, all of the authority, all of it, and there's Joseph and he's standing there and he has this opportunity to make his world a whole lot bigger. When he could stand it no longer, he pushed everyone else out of the room except for his brothers. And he took a step into that place and opened his heart and invited them to come back. The story goes on where the brothers, they reconcile with Joseph, but as you go through the story of Joseph, you'll know at the end when Jacob actually ends up dying, the brothers come back because they think now Joseph will take his vengeance. Now that dad is dead. And once again, Joseph had this moment to stand in front of his brothers. He could have, he could have extracted that cost, he could have. But instead, he chose to make his world bigger. And from that, we have the 12 tribes of Israel. We have the nation of Israel that grows. We have the descendants beyond this, the, the sand on the seashore, the stars in the sky is the promise that God gave to Abraham. And right there we have men and women of God who are choosing to open their hearts and love and grace and allow the world to get a little bit bigger. And the world was awoken to a nation of people that actually love God. The world was awakened to a nation of people that God was with. And then all these years later through Christ, when Christ came and the Bible says we're going to call this guy Emmanuel, which means God is with us. We don't need to be a Joseph to have God with us. We just need to be who we are. And, and it's being who we are before you know it. People will be seeing the presence of God with us and they'll be knowing that God is with us. They'll be sensing that God is with us because we will be loving them as Christ has loved us. Not everyone accepts your love, but it should never stop you from giving your love. Our love is never dependent on their response. Our love is dependent on, on Christ's command. He's called us to love, even if we are not. And Jesus said in the Gospels at one point, he said, uh, you'll be actually be hated because of me. That's not a selling point if you're a marketer. Right? Does that make sense? Like, but Jesus, he doesn't sugarcoat stuff. I don't know if you noticed that. As much as he doesn't sugarcoat the painful words, he doesn't sugarcoat the love. He shows it what it's really like. So in John chapter 13, Jesus gets up from a table and puts on an apron. The Bible says he shows the disciples the full extent of his love. He shows them how real his love is. He shows them how powerful his love is. He shows them time and time again how far his love would go. You know, that one story that always speaks to me about how much Christ will do or go for us is that story of the man who was formerly known as Legion. Jesus wake up one morning and he says to his disciples, how about we go for a sail on the lake? They've gone, awesome, great idea. But Jesus is going to a graveyard. That's the only thing he's doing that day. Sailing to a graveyard to find a guy who's possessed. And when he gets there, you know what I mean, right? He goes towards the man and not runs away from the man. And the man comes towards him. And at that moment, Jesus opens his heart. And before you know it, the guy is changed, delivered and set free in front of him. Every single time you choose to love, your world will change, our world will change. As a church community of people, Every time we have an opportunity to love on each other is an opportunity for our church to grow, for our world to get a little bit bigger. I wonder whether this morning that we could just bring that downstairs. 
I wonder whether this morning that we could get down there and uh, you know what small talk is? If we could do that for 30 seconds and then do an hour of hard talk, could we do that? I know for Australians, small talk is our, our, our native tongue, but I, I want to get past that. I want us to see the hearts and the lives of each other. So here's how I'm finishing. On Thursday night last week, I started a new prophetic mentoring group with our church here, and I gave them some homework. Do you remember the homework, Dirty? You do? Good. You remember the homework, Bev? Um, I've asked them today, you know how we haven't done our 60 second meet and greet? I actually forgot it, but now I remember it. Their job and their homework right now, as Laura comes up to play the piano, if Laura, um, Darren, can you come and play the piano? Is that right? Um, here she is. Their job is to get up and go to someone and just give them a word or a verse of scripture. Can you guys do that for everyone who is here on Thursday night? Just to, just to jump up and just look for a face that God wants to speak into and just go and speak to them a word. Let's do it. Be brave. For those who weren't here on Thursday night, and you feel like you'd like to do this exercise, I wonder whether you'd like to get up. Just go to someone else in the room and just speak a word of... What we are watching is the world of our church getting bigger. Allow your world to get bigger. Be brave. Reach out. Don't withhold. As a church now, I just want you to put your mind into Scripture once again. And to find a Bible verse inside of that world, just to go, God, can you just drop one verse into my mind? Just, just one verse. Once you have that verse, I want you to go around to someone else in the building and give them that verse. You can say something like, uh, this is what's on my heart. You can say something like, it might not mean much to you, but it means something to me and I just want to pass it on to you. Come on, be brave. Let's get up. Speak a word into somebody else. Let's go, church. Come on. speak something to someone, I just want to encourage you to break through that moment of fear and just go and speak to somebody the verse or the thought or the word that's on your heart. as I have loved you. This is not just a good idea. 
This is the very thing that Christ has given to us to awaken the body of Christ. This is the very thing that Christ has given to us to awaken the world. Love others as I have loved you. Jesus calls it a command, but he invites you to do it. He invites you to love others as he has loved you. Father in heaven, I thank you for this time this morning and I thank you for words that have passed. And Jesus, I want to pray that more will happen downstairs as we gather around a table. And Father, I pray that today that you'll break off as any fear that will prevent us from speaking out something of your kingdom, something of your words, something of your love. And allow your love to just permeate through those fears and drive them away and so that we can be free. Free to love. Free to open our hearts. Free to come into reconciliation and restoration. Free to stand where Joseph stood and to open his heart to those that may have betrayed and draw them back into a place where restoration is being placed back on the table. Grace is back on the table. Forgiveness is back on the table. Father, I want to pray that those words will become bigger words in our lives. That right now, that the, the relationships that are in our minds, Lord, that those words will become prayers. And in those prayers, they become invitation, Father, for you to do what only you can do. That you will undo the hardness of hearts that, are, that might be in our own hearts towards somebody else. And Jesus, that you'll again come and plough up that hard ground so that we can love as you have loved us. We thank you, Jesus, for the love that you have poured out so freely. It is the love that we stand in, it's the love that we, we breathe in, it's the love that we speak and to live our lives by. And today, Father, it's the love in this room that is changing lives right now. And so, Father, I pray for the words that have been spoken into hearts of people all over this room. That the seed that has been sown will be now be watered and it will come to a place of harvest where these seeds will become testimony and story in the days that are ahead of us. That we will be a people that are able to look back on mornings like this and to remember a word that was sown into our spirit. To remember a word when my world was awoken. Is it a too big a prayer to pray that the world be awoken to the Father's love? I think not. And as the baby cries, the new life is heard. And we are awoken. Do not fear, for it is love is the antidote for fear. Allow the love of Jesus today to permeate every area of your life, to bring healing, to bring restoration. In Jesus' name, amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time this morning. As we go downstairs, Lord, we just want to say a grace. And Father, we just know that that food down there is already blessed. Jesus, we invite you to come and pull a chair up at that table. Lord, our conversation, our food, Lord, bless each part of it. And may today this church get bigger through the love that it shares. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on downstairs. Let's have some lunch.